Thank you all for joining us this morning. My name is Ben Neely. I'm the Executive Director of the Bruce History Center. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here to our auditorium for this morning's program. I'm very happy to have you here on this rainy Saturday morning. It's a perfect day for something like this, isn't it? Uh, just a couple of notes before we get started. One, I always I have to make a pitch for membership while I'm up here. And so if there's anybody that's joined us who's, who's not a member, we'd love to have you as a member. Uh, one, of the, one of the best benefits of our, our membership is uh, receiving the historical review of Berks County. It's our quarterly magazine. It's been in publication since 1935. Our speaker today, Brian Engelhardt, is a frequent contributor uh, to, to the magazine here. Uh, it covers a wide variety of, of subjects, always focusing on local history, but really get a sense of how our, our local Berks history connects to national and global uh, history through a lot of the stories we're reading and reviewing. So it's an outstanding publication as part of our membership program. So if you're not a member, we can fix that for you. Today in the lobby, you see Amy at the front desk, and she will solve this terrible problem you have <laughs> right away. Uh, also, I wanted to announce we have a, a new exhibit open back in the Palmer Gallery. It's a photography of Dr. William A. Heyman. If you haven't seen it, take an opportunity to do it today. Of course, feel free to, to tour the entire museum. You don't know, we actually have three levels of exhibits here. We'd love to see you tour through. That always makes us happy to see folks in the galleries. Some upcoming programs here. In May, we have uh, Holy Valley Barn Tour. Uh, that's going to be on May 22nd. And if you've been on previous barn tours, I hope you enjoyed them. But these barn tours, it's not a repeat of uh, past barns, it's a new barn. So uh, if you enjoy those, keep, keep going. If you've never been on one, go ahead and join us here. Um, we are going to, at the end of the month, uh, the Berks History Center is going to go to Saratoga Springs with uh, White Star Tours for a few days. Uh, in June, uh, we have a program that's going to be Thursday, June 9th from 6 to 8. We have Twisted Mindful Pretzel Consumption. And uh, that ought to be a nice evening program back here in the auditorium here. Uh, next Saturday, uh, June, uh, second Saturday in June, we have uh, memories of a bygone era of the South Mountain Resorts at Warnersville. And I'll be back here at 10 a.m. that morning. Uh, we have a summer sunflower basket workshop coming up on June 18th from 9 to 3. We also have our junior historian camp. If anyone's got children or grandchildren, they, they might enjoy that. That's going to be on June 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Uh, then Berks History Center is going to uh, surprise me. Staten Island with uh, Charlie Adams. Is going to be our tour. Yeah, take us to Staten Island on June 25th. That's an all day trip, 7 30. We're getting going and uh, getting back at uh, 7 o'clock here. Uh, you can learn more about all these by, uh, programs by going to our website, perkshistory.org. You can follow us on social media. We live on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, today's program is going to be followed by a showing of a movie. We're here to have a program. Uh, uh, Brian Inkhart's program is before he was a Catcher or a Spy, No Birds Year and 1925 Reading Keys. We're going to be screening a movie today that Catcher Was a Spy, starring Paul Rudd and Jeff Daniels afterwards. We're going to start that at 11.30. We're going to have some hot dogs and other snacks here, some nice ballpark type food uh, to enjoy the movie. So if you'd like to stay with us for that, we'd be very happy to have you join us. Probably should put a, a disclaimer out. The movie's rated R. It's a scene to play. <laughs> You think you might be offended by that? You can a warning now. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll start that at, at 11:30. And this program also has another follow-up to it, and that is next Saturday on May 21st, down at uh, First Energy Stadium. There'll be a tour uh, kicking off at 11. There's, since you're here today, there's no extra charge for you to, to join that tour. If you'd like to bring someone that day, it's five dollars for folks that didn't uh, already participate in today's program. Uh, but come on down, and, and Brian and Charlie will actually be down there. And, and if you call in the next five minutes, you get <laughs> set of <weeks> tonight. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Could I just ask the group for anybody who would like to do that tour? Could you let us know so that we know that we actually have a tour? Because at this point, we don't have anybody signed up. So just let us know that you'd like to go. And uh, yes. 11. 11 a.m. next Saturday. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. We have a tour. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So that, that's the end of my announcements here. I'm going to turn the mic over to Brian Engelhardt. We're very happy to have him here this morning. He's, he's 
been an outstanding resource for the History Center. If I can just say a couple nice words about him. Uh, Brian, actually, he serves on our Board of Trustees, a uh, member of many committees, always volunteering for different events, and doing speaking games, engagements like this on, uh, for, on our behalf, both here in the auditorium and out in the community. Uh, so we, we really appreciate him, and uh, you're in for a treat this morning. So thank you so much for helping welcome Brian. He knew all the tendencies 
of all the hitters. He knew how to control pitchers. He knew how to call the game. He knew how to tell the catcher that was playing ahead of him what to do, what to call in the game. And then would listen to him because he knew his stuff. He knew his stuff. Um, he, what was it, 117 games he played without making an error, which stood as a record uh, until well, a few years ago, Mark Redman broke it. And now, of course, Rick, uh, it's, uh, what's the record now? Mike Buffini has 256 games without an error, but you knew that. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but he held the record for decades for games without an error. But all that aside, the one thing he did as a defensive, it was an impressive thing. He had a way on a pop fly, pop pop up, he would take his mask, Throw it in the air, catch the ball, catch his pants. <laughs> but he only did that on ladies' days. He liked the ladies. <laughs> anyway, so that was. Uh, the thing about, oh, he, he spoke 10 languages, 12 languages. He had a linguistics degree from Princeton. He uh, spoke, uh, in his, his parents were. Ukrainian Jewish immigrants, and so they spoke Yiddish and Russian in the home, but that's how he started out that way. But so he spoke fluently 10 or 12 languages, depending on what you read. But Ted Lyons, one of his teammates along the way, said, Yeah, he spoke those languages, uh, but he couldn't hit in any of them. <laughs> Buck Krauss, who was another teammate of his, one time said, Mo. I don't care how many of them damn degrees you got, they didn't never learn you how to hit a curveball. <laughs> so, and he did. All right. Um, just some general information about him as we, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, his career and all that fascinating stuff that you've committed to memory. This will be on the quiz. Okay. He was a unique.
No, he didn't do that. He just said, they can't see me, so we're okay. Okay. Um, Tom Yawkey, the owner of the Boston Red Sox, Monk played for the Red Sox, one of the five teams he played for. Tom Yawkey said he was the Toscanini of the mind. John Kiernan was the New York Times head of the sports writers. He said he had a mind he could have been a Supreme Court justice and he wasted it on baseball. But Kiernan said that Burt was probably the most fascinating sports figure that he had ever come across uh, over the years. Um, that's a picture of Mo Bird on um, Information Please, which was a radio show where people would go on and they would ask you questions. And if you answer the questions right, you would win a prize. No, Mo Bird was never stumped on Information Please. He was on like four or five times. Um, and at one point, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Langus, who was still a commissioner of baseball, was introduced to him, he said, Burr, you did more good in that half hour when you were on the radio for baseball than I did the whole time I was commissioner. So, uh, it, you know, it was the image of the baseball players are, are, are big dumb moments. He, he, uh, he put that to rest. Let's talk about Mo the Man. Uh, born in Harlem, his parents were Russian immigrants. Uh, in four, at age four, his family moved to New York, New Jersey. They first moved into downtown New York for just a short time. And then the family did something unusual. They were Orthodox Jews. He moved out, Mr. Burr, the young, what's his name? Edward Burr, moved out to the suburbs where all the Protestants were, and opened up a pharmacy out there. And they even went to a uh, Protestant church. Uh, they just changed, they wanted to blend in out there. Mo uh, didn't want to be revealed. He played in a youth baseball league, and instead of saying his name is Mo Berg, he used the name Ron Wolf. Uh, so there was five people in the family. He had a sister and a brother, and uh, so uh, anyway, after he graduates from high school, he goes to NYU for a semester, two semesters, and then he transfers to Princeton, where he becomes a linguistics major and flourishes. He graduates pull out, and uh, those are that was his language training, and he. Uh, took all those courses. He was a star shortstop on the baseball team. He had a gun of an arm. And uh, the one thing about Princeton was it was not as enlightened as it might have been about Jewish people. They had eating clubs, even still now, and even still now. <laughs> okay. uh, even now at Princeton, there's eating clubs. And if you want to be anybody, you want to be in an eating club in Princeton. Well, one of Mo's friends on the baseball team wanted to be in an eating club, and he wanted Mo to be. And he said to the eating club, who was soliciting him, well, I'll join your eating club, but you've got to ask for It's always a Jew. He said, yeah, but he's a good Jew. You've got to ask for And so they deliberate, and they come back and they say, all right, here's the deal. We will ask Berg, and we'll let Berg join, but he can't ask any other Jews, okay? So the guy goes back to Mo. Mo says, no, that's the deal. You join. I want you to join. Thank you for, thank you, and the fellow joined. Mo Berg, until his dying day when he was 70, spoiler alert, um, would go to Princeton for lots of basketball games, football games, all kinds of athletic events. He never went to any reunions or any official school events. He was very bitter 
about the facet of discrimination that he experienced uh, on a personal level during the time that he was there. So, uh, just a little insight into the man. Um, all right. Well, then. He goes back and come loud. So, so what happens? Princeton is close to New York, so the Giants and the Dodgers, or the Robins, because they call the Wilbert Robinson was the manager of the Brooklyn franchise, so they stopped calling the Dodgers and they called them the Robins for the 20 or so years that Will Rob Wilbert Robinson was their manager. So anyway, uh, 18 years. Anyway, uh, he said uh, so that the Dodgers wanted a Jewish ball player because of New York, and the Giants wanted a Jewish ball player because of New York. And Mo was no dummy. The Giants were pretty good, the Dodgers were. The Dodgers had crappy shortstops, the Giants had very good shortstops. So he signed with the Dodgers, he thought it would be a quicker path to advancement. And he got a $5,000 bonus. And, uh, yeah, it was a path to advance. He graduated from Princeton on a Friday, and he was playing for the Dodgers two days later. Uh, he did play a number of games for the Dodgers for the rest of the season, 49 games, and he hit uh, 186. That's not good. So anyway, uh, but, so he got his $5,000. What does Mo do with this $5,000? He goes to the Sorbonne, not to Disneyland, not to Disney World. He, he, half of, he gives half of it to his parents, and he goes to the Sorbonne. And he takes Latin and Greek and science courses in Latin and Greek. And uh, he's walking around in Paris one day, and who does he bump into but John McGraw, the manager of the Giants, and Hugh Jennings who was a coach at that point, but had been manager, uh, both of them are in the Hall of Fame. And John McGraw says, Burr, what are you doing here? And Burr says, let's have dinner. So he has dinner with John McGraw and tells him all about the 20 or so courses he's taking at the Sorbonne in the off season. Most guys go out and shoot deer in the off season. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, he goes to the Sorbonne and uh, John McGraw is astounded. Comes back and says uh, to a reporter, I bumped into Mo Burr. And uh, I, it, it, the reporter interviewed him about that. And the quote was, Shades of Kelly and Anson. That's King Kelly and Cap Anson, old time baseball greats. Who ever heard of a ball player spending his vacation studying Latin in Paris? But times, I guess, they do change. That was John McGraw's quote. Okay. So, keep in mind, Mo hit 186 when he played for Brooklyn the year before. So, there, and he didn't show up for spring training at uh, in time. So, he finally shows up to the Minneapolis team, and uh, Mo Bird, well versed in foreign languages and long missing from a heart. Minneapolis camp pulled into Indianapolis this morning. Uh, so he is down in the minor leagues. All right, the minor leagues. Halfway through the season, Toledo has a terrible team, and they lend him because they need players. They have a lot of injuries. So he's, he plays for those two teams. He hits 264, which is better than 186. <laughs> but it's not like good. So, um, and so, so he spends that year in the mornings. So what happens? Mr. Burke comes to Ray. The Dodgers had an arrangement in baseball, they had things called options. A major league team could put a player with another minor league team, and they would say to the minor league team, he's yours. But, if we want him back, we can exercise that option by paying you money. So 
he was going to be option to ready. Most of us, I don't want to be option ready. I want to play in Brooklyn. I want to be in big leagues with my friends. So uh, maybe I'll go back and study it to survive. So Spencer Adam, the manager of the Reading team, goes to Newark where Mo is sulking. Not Newark, yeah, the suburb of Newark. But he's sulking, he says, Mo, we need you. You'll really do something. Come to Reading. And uh, so Mo goes, well, all right, I'll come to Reading. And he signs a contract, and the Reading papers are ecstatic. There's an example of some great sports writing here. Uh, the Keys have a Princeton shortstop, and maybe they could open the Yale lock to the first division. Now that's sports writing, okay? That's sports writing. Yeah, they don't do it like that anymore. Okay. All right. The Reading Keys played at Lowers Park. It's a Fourth and Buttonwood, it's, it's a new and youth park, it's been re restored. Uh, you can see the Deppin Brewery, the scoreboard, that's where they put it. They had some problems. They were bad, the franchise, from the get-go. They really didn't ever have the financial base they needed to get the players that they should have had. You can take a look, they did have one year of 500. This is, uh, what it might have looked like if they had had a lot of people there, this was what it usually looked like. <laughs> Empty stands. So, uh, so that be, they wanted to put fannies in the seats. And if you take a look from 1923 to 24, they went from third place, 1924, they went down to seventh place. Uh, it was a year to forget. Read them in a week, they finished seventh place. They got a new president, they got a new business manager. Spencer Abbott stayed on. Just a word about Spencer Abbott. He was old school back when old school was really old school. And uh, the first thing he did when he comes to the Reading Keys was uh, he finds out all the wives and girlfriends have this one section that they don't get to sit in, the reserved seats. Well, I'm not going to do that. Spencer says, uh, well, when you have a hand party of that sort, you're bound to have discussion about the players, and there's going to be trouble. So he assigned each girlfriend and wife a seat in the ballpark to make sure that there wouldn't be trouble with them mingling and comparing their uh, signals. The, the, the ultimate, their, their significant other's performances. So, that's just a little bit out of sense. Old school. Okay. People were very happy that were sports writers in Reading with Mo Berg. He was a good copy. Uh, he was a little witty. He was literate. Uh, they liked him. There was three papers in town. The Eagle had Bill Reedy as their key sports writer. The Times had a young man named Shandy Hill who was very <laughs> creative and funny and a guy named Dan Harper. And the Tribune was a paper that existed for about half a dozen years. Walter Dunn was a very good one who was a Walter Dunn writes a sweet fielder this mo, And he writes, uh, Berg, Berg is one of the cleanest fielders to be found and not sports writers. Gets the apple away in scarcely with any scarcely any lost time. He gallops over the ground, sticks his big mitts in front of the ball, and away it goes to the first baseman. A sweet fielder, this small. That's sports writer. Okay. Uh, Bird does another unusual thing down in East Bird, Florida, where they're having spring training. He buys some real estate from the mayor. There's the real estate guy. So everybody on the team starts buying real estate, including the manager. So the reporter says, they used to talk baseball between games. Now all they're talking about is their appreciation of their property values. So 
And what they uh, said, uh, since Moberg bought land in Florida, the players insist that the newest Leesburg suburb will be Moberg. <laughs> anyway, uh, there was an article about all Moberg would talk about was his height. And uh, he was very modest. He wouldn't boast about his accomplishments on the diamond. And uh, Dan Harper just said how remarkable it was that he would, any attention he would get, he would deflect it to his teammates. So, uh, anyway, the reporters were quite happy with what Mo presented to them, which is nice of course. In the meanwhile, they're putting a baseball team together. Mo is a shortstop with a great range and a gun on an arm. He's six foot two, he's big for a shortstop. And so they get a guy, Heine Shear, played for the A's for a couple of years. He only hit 230, he wasn't much of a hitter, but he was a good fielder. So Walter Henry Heine Shear, uh, and uh, he and Berg put together what the Reading papers term the hasty Hebrews. Uh, two Jewish guys up the middle. It's a double play combination. And uh, the, excuse me. They had 11 double plays in eight games. And they, Walter Dunn writes in the Reading Tribune double plays were more or less parts of a lost art in this league until the hasty Hebrews came to revive the spirit of baseball in this community. And uh, these were the finest double play combination that ever patrolled a Reading field. One thing, that, uh, alliterative sports writing, the most notable pair on board the good ship Keystone down there is, and here's a mouthful, the hasty Hebrew Hassock Hopperdeers, Moberg and Heidi Shear. Okay. You'll get a bonus with the quiz. Uh, what is a hasty Hebrew house of here? I'm just going to take a stab at it. Let's start at the end. A halberdier is a spear carrier, so they're like sentries. A hassock is a pillow, except if you do some research, you find that they would refer to the bases as the hassocks around the diamond. And so, they were guardians of the bases, yeah. Uh, again, I just keep saying this again and again. That's sports writing. <laughs> All right. So there's my new shear. Uh, opening day, they get a couple more professional hitters. They're going to try to make this a decent baseball team, the, the ownership. Uh, Chick Shorten, had been the majors. Howard Camp, lifetime minor leaguer, but they can hit. I just think that is such a cool front page uh, announcing uh, the opening day and you know, that is cool. They don't do it like that anymore. Uh, but that's the opening day and they have these guys uh, that are new hired guns. There we go. Uh, oh, Spencer Abbott's quote was, You'll see a club that'll fight to the last inning and the last out. Which shows you that coach speak has not changed one gosh darn bit since 1925. Right? Okay. Well, first game they lose 4 to 2. Not enough runs. Moberg is 0 for 4. They lose. But not to be discouraged. Mo is turning into a Swatsman. A Swatsman, you say? I don't know a Swatsman. Well, Walter Dunn said, or Dan Harper says, quite a Swatsman this bird is turning into. Uh, we have the middle of our lineup plugged. He goes uh, six for six uh, one day and uh, Pushes him over 300, Swatsmith that he is, and uh, 
he only goes below 300 once for the rest of the season. So he, he was a very active hitter. May 18th. Uh, but that's the makings of a SWAT smith. Except SWAT smith is too long for world. All right. The well-dressed SWAT smith is somebody that's hit three home runs in a week. Now, if you've ever seen the cartoon down there, uh, what's his name, Stark? Uh, yeah, Abe Stark had a camera shop in Brooklyn, and at Evans Field, there was a sign out of the outfield wall that said, hit this sign and win a free suit from Abe Stark's tailor shop. Now the interesting thing is, the wall is big. The sign was down there. Nobody did ever get that sign. But cartoon in the New Yorker, the presumably that's Abe Feldman behind the outfielder with the glove, making sure that, <laughs> hey, uh, but lo and behold, there's a horrendous week in May where Wiener's men's clothing, which closed a few years ago, but they were in Penn Street, uh, if you hit three home runs in a span of seven days, you would win a suit. And Polly McClary, the first baseman, and Bird both hit three home runs within that seven days. So I think Mr. Wiener was sitting weeping, but the umpire made the presentation in a game in, a game in May of the, the suits to each of them on behalf of Wieners. So that it was the well-dressed, the well-dressed Swatsman compliments of Wieners next door. Uh, so Spencer Abbott was all set to hang around and fight to the, then he got a job uh, at a, with a major league team that he could move out. The team, the teaser came over 500, and uh, he's going to join the Brooklyn Robins in the front office, steadier job. And uh, this is interesting. The team gives him a traveling bag, which the article notes was an expensive traveling bag, very nice traveling bag. But it's kind of like, here's your traveling bag, what's your hurry? <laughs> See you, Spence. Okay, so Spence goes, and uh, they're in a 500, and what happens? Chick Shorten becomes the manager. Chip Shorten becomes the manager, and they win 17 out of their next 23 games. Wow! No stopping them. They beat Syracuse 11 to nothing. Uh, they have a triple play. Big day, June 20th, 1925. Uh, and the team moves into second place on unchartered territory. Uh, so, With the triple play, we have to have some more sports right in here. Commentary. Three farmers rested on the sacks. One was Niebuhr Garner and one was Craig. With none out, Parks, the Syracuse hurler, pulled a short high fly to camp in right field. That was the keys right. Howard Camp, after snaring the pill, whipped it over to McClary, the first base, who touched first, killing Niebergall, runner there. And in the same instant, or a second later, Polly McClary shot the apple home, and Craigie was out at the Pentagon. <laughs> So, uh, that's, that was that. This is genuinely out of the paper. It was the first time Redding had ever been into the rarefied air of second place. And if they even won the first, that was the, put that in the sports section. Uh, and there was a high water mark. But that was General Armistead, the high-water market Gettysburg, 
He's charged July 3rd, and he gets up there, but we know what happened to General Armstead and the South and after the high water mark. Sadly enough, what happens is they start selling their good players. They, they sell Heine Shear to Elmira. Uh, they break up the hasty Hebrews. No, no, they can't. Heine goes to Elmira. He says, I'm not going to Elmira. I'm going home to New York. Sit this out. Well, he got home to New York, and I think his wife said, what are you doing here? Go to Elmira and keep sending me money. So, Doc Silva, who we write for the Reagan Times for years, he was an outfielder on that team. He got traded too. All, but pretty much most of the good players, Mo didn't get sold. He would just get sold later. But they, they <coughs> broke up that gang, and uh, what happens when you sell all your good players? You stink. And uh, read them and weep, as they say. Uh, they went from being in second place, high, pretty much over 500. Uh, they were ugly in August, ugly in July, in September, and finished under 500. So, enough of that. <coughs> A moment of silence for the good team. Okay. But what could happen worse than being a bad team? Being a bad team, you get sold, and it's going to leave town. Oh my God, they're going to go to Newark. Charles <laughs> Davis, who was described as a sportsman in Newark, bought the team, and he announced after the season was over, he was going to move them up to Newark and build them a new stadium. Can't beat that with a stick. That's what he's going to do. Is anybody happy about that down here? No, of course not. Bill Reedy, who was the least funny, but probably the most intellectually capable of the local sports writers, he was the Eagle writer, pointed out Reading had the second highest attendance in the Eastern League, I mean uh, the International League. Why are they in town? They're the best financial shape they've been in for years, and they're leaving town. And this is a cartoon uh, baseball fan, Reading baseball fan. Isn't it awful what they expect me to swallow? This will do the city good. Reading has baseball. It's too small for international league. Independent ball's better. Reading will do it. So there was outrage. Outrage, I said. Um, and if that wasn't enough, what Newark's doing is stealing our baseball team. In the swimsuit competition, for the Miss America Central Atlantic Division. Miss Newark beat Miss Reading in the swimsuit category. Oh my God. <laughs> Florence Zawinski, there be, she has her radiance. Uh, Scrabble points out, what is this? Miss Newark beats Miss Reading in bathing suit test? Then Newark gets our ball club. We're not gonna like Newark very much. Uh, it was pretty bad. But wait. The Ashtons come to the rescue. Well, they sort of come to the rescue. They, they, they had this team in Providence that had been, uh, they moved it to Providence because it wasn't working elsewhere. And so they said, shit, we're not going to pay. We're not drawing anybody in Providence. Let's move to Reading. So they said, Good news, you're losing your ball club, well, we'll move our ball club down there, okay? So, Providence, it, when it came to town, the sports writers would say, well, Providence is playing, the future Reading Keys are playing the future Newark Bears. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that was a quick fix. Mr. Adams in the back row wrote a stirring article about the 26 Keys for the history Start review and how the Ashtons really made a mess of things. They did, they did, they did. But at least in 1925, it looked like, well, they're going to give us a baseball team. Better than nothing. Okay, at the end of the season, Moe's in another triple play. Uh, 
He kicks his average over 300 again. He didn't get below. Uh, he goes 14 for 21. He's on fire. And uh, finishes 200 hits, 311, nine triple, or nine home runs. And uh, he leads the lead in errors, but Reddy had the most subtle plays between him and Piney. They, they uh, did a lot of good. So, uh, so there's Mo. Finishes the season with nice numbers. And the team stinks. They're not in last place, but they're way below where they should be. Off to do it. And Mo, in the meanwhile, is on the market. The Dodgers are marketing his option, and other teams are bidding for him. Ultimately, the Chicago White Sox buy him for $6,000. And they say, Mo, okay, we'll see ya soon. Come on up. And Mo says, no, I'll see you next spring. I'm going to Columbia Law School. It's almost as good as Disney World. There's Columbia Law School. There's Mo looking lawyers. He eventually gets his law degree there in the off season after four years. But uh, the White Sox are a bit puzzled. He plays for the White Sox in the beginning as a reserve infielder. And then one day, one day, there's this situation. The manager of the team, Ray Shaw, who's, who's a catcher, who's in the Hall of Fame, he's injured. He hurt his hand. He's a catcher. Harry McCurdy's a catcher. Buck Kraus is a catcher. Both of them have broken hands. Nobody can catch. <clears throat> and uh, so they uh, go into the locker room with everybody, and uh, Ray Shaw says, Men, I need a volunteer. I need a catcher. Now, Earl Sheely was six foot four and a backup first baseman and big. And Mo thought to himself, yeah. He, he would be good as a catcher. So Mo says, I think you already have a catcher here and you don't know it. Ray Shaw, after Mo says that, goes, Thank you, Mo. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's one of two. That, that's a more colorful story. The other story is Mo said, Well, I'll be a catcher. That's not fun to tell. Uh, anyway. So he becomes catcher, and he, he, he does well. He hits 280 for, it's a regular catcher for a while. And then in spring of 1930, he's with his cleats on, he steps on a drainage grate and tears up his ligaments in his leg. In 1930, he's in 15 games, he's about 110. He's no good. Uh, they sell him to Cleveland because uh, the manager of Cleveland knows Mo has good brain. It's Roger Peckinpah. And uh, Mo hits 77, which is what I'm hitting with my senior league right now. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Um, anyway, and so at the end of the season, he has lots of input and insight, but they say goodbye, Mo. And he's released. He's picked up by Washington, because Walter Johnson's the manager, and Walter Johnson knows how smart Moberg is, too. Uh, and then after Walter Johnson's fired, Joe Cronin's the manager, and Mo and Joe Cronin have a very magical relationship between the two of them. Mo had to play for a while, and Cronin says to him, after Mo hadn't been in the game for two months, he said, Mo. You haven't been in the game for, but to, can you go in? Mo looks and says, Are there still, if a battery of three strikes will be me out? He says, Well, yeah, this is good. I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> uh, so. uh, Mo's on the red side. In 1932, he does something very unusual. He left the O'Doul place for the Dodgers at that point. Herb Hunter, who's a trainer, and Ted Lyons, who was one of those teammates on the White Sox, the four of them go to Japan. And the purpose of their trip to go to Japan is to teach 
coaches and managers how to play baseball. They were playing it already there, but what about bunting? What about the whole concept behind hit and run and things like that? He wanted that, that they were going to teach him technique. And so you get it taught right at the top, it will benefit the whole system. And so they're there for several weeks. And everybody else goes home at the end, not well. He enrolls in a Japanese university, and takes classes there and uh, for about a month. And then when he goes home, he goes home by way of Manchuria and then Southeast Asia. Uh, and he goes through the Egypt and the Middle East. He takes the scenic route from <laughs> Unusual fellow. He does not fish or hunt in the off season. Okay. So that's the first Japanese tour. Yay! The Senators win the pennant, the Senators win the pennant. Down at the bottom, Al Schock and Nick Altrock were coaches on the Senators. Al Schock and Nick Altrock each were known at one time or another as the clown prince of baseball. They were funny. This is Mo showing them how they eat certain things in Japan. And they're getting a lot of laughs out of that. Okay. Clark Griffith and Joe Cronin, uh, they lose to the Giants in the World Series, but Mo is on a World Series team, a pennant winner. That's pretty good. Uh, and then, even though they won the pennant, they're running out of money. Joe Cronin is Clark Griffith's son in law. And that doesn't stop him from selling his son-in-law to the Boston Red Sox, or Griffith, the owner. And so Cronin goes to the Red Sox. He sells Mo to the Indians, and the Indians are back having Mo's brain, but he doesn't get for squat for them. Uh, but he goes on an all-star tour, and this will be dramatized in the movie. I don't want to spoil that. Um, Mo, uh, you'll notice a lot of these faces. Jimmy Fox, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Connie Mack, Mo up in the upper left hand corner. Their wives, uh, other people that were great ball players for a long. And he said, Mo! Okay. Anyway. Uh, a funny story. They get there, and uh, a Japanese guy comes up to Babe Ruth and starts speaking. And Babe looks at Mo and says, Can you help me? Can you speak Japanese? No, I don't to speak Japanese. Sorry. So a week later, Babe's walking along, and there is Mo speaking in Japanese to four or five Japanese people. And Babe says, Mo, you told me you didn't speak Japanese. He said, I was that So, anyway. Uh, the most dramatic part of this trip, the American ambassador's daughter was in the hospital that was the tallest building in Tokyo. And Mo says, can I visit her? So Mo has a bouquet of flowers and puts on a kimono. And he goes to the hospital to visit this woman with a bouquet of flowers, gets past the security guard, throws the flowers away, and whips out his movie camera. And he goes to the highest point in the hospital where you can see the entire uh, horizon and outline of the city of Tokyo. And he films it. It's 1934. The question is, why did he film it? Is he a patriot? Was he under a secret mission? Nobody ever found that out. All he did was give those films to the government. And then the question is, were they used in the bombing mission for the Doolittle Bombers a few years later? Or were, were they just something that was put in the drawer? Uh, 
Uh, but it was certainly, it was the defense, you know, factories and different defense buildings and the like. But that's what Mo did in his second Japanese tour. He's back with Joe Cronin again and uh, has a special relationship just keeping him from his brain. And now it's time to hear from Craig because it's at this time that he makes acquaintance of a young man from Berks County named Charles Wagner. And ladies and gentlemen, I present Craig Wagner. Thank you. 
some of the things you're all going to go have a high school. And one, one morning when she brought up the thing, uh, they were in a restaurant and for breakfast, and no bird ordered lamb chops. And the waitress looked at him like, what, why are you ordering lamb chops for breakfast? He said, well, whoever said you had to have eggs for breakfast? So another quirky thing that he did. Uh, I had one little other story, uh, which would be uh, about the spy. Uh, my dad said uh, one time, he said, he knew Mo Bird was something special when they were playing in Washington and President Roosevelt was at the game and as they were walking past to the dugout, President Roosevelt went to Mo and he said, Hi, Mo. And my dad said, he knew something was going on. And then he said, Hi, Mo. <laughs> So I'll conclude with that, but uh, Brian, thank you. And well, thank you for this. Uh, here are the bells, or here are the bells. We'll be concluding shortly. Um, just as a reminder to the role of Charles Wagner and Ray, the Charlie Wagner press box is that uh, First energies. I was going to say this in the stadium. Okay. Mo retires from baseball and needs something to fill up his free time, so he becomes a spy for the Office of Strategic Services. First, he's an ambassador in South America, and that's not quite. It's it's not a, quite an ambassador, and we're not really sure what he did. But there was a lot of Nazis in South America. Um, anyway. Uh, he uh, is hired. Wild Bill Donovan on the right was the chief of the OSS. He's played by Jack Daniels in the movie you'll see, and in the uh, Fighting 69th, where Bill Donovan won his Medal of Honor, uh, that movie, George Brett plays Wild Bill Donovan, for those of you keeping score at home. There he is at breakfast with uh, Casey Stengel and General Leslie Groves, chatting. General Leslie Groves is in charge of the Manhattan Project. And for those of you who were in the college class I taught and didn't know what the frickin' Manhattan Project was, that was where the atomic bomb was developed. Okay. Uh, so, and Howard Dix was in charge of the unit, and we're gonna, that was supposed to keep an eye on the Germans' development of the atomic bomb. <laughs> they wanted it to be way behind us. And so that he, that's who he palled around with. Um, he also parachuted into Yugoslavia. And his job was to come back and size up. There was two resistance forces. There was the Titoists, the communists, and the Chetniks. They were quasi-fascists, but they were fighting the Germans. And uh, his appraisal was the Chetniks were going to, after the war, the Titoists were going to outgun the Chetniks, and it would be wise for our government to put their money on the Titoists, because the Chetniks, which politically, when it says support the communists, it, it was not a popular opinion, but Tito's won. Anyway, uh, so the most dramatic thing he did involved Werner Heisenberg, uh, who had a principle of uncertainty. And I, this is going to be on the quiz. The more precisely the position of some particle is determined, the less precisely its momentum can be known, and vice versa. All right, uh, Heisenberg was the number one scientist in the German atomic program. He was going to go to a forum in Zurich, in Switzerland, as a neutral country. The instructions Berg had was, go there undercover, engage Heisenberg in a conversation you know, attend his lectures, somehow engage in a conversation, and figure out whether he's 
helping or whether they're close to developing an atomic bomb or they, whether they've done it. And if he's close or they're making progress, then either kidnap him or kill him. And oh, by the way, here's a cyanide tablet. <coughs> Neither of them go very well. So he goes to Zurich, and it's very dramatic in the movie. And my wife says, Shut up. I want to watch the movie. I got some history. Anyway, uh, we were watching it. Um, he determines that Heisenberg really is disinterested. Heisenberg didn't like Hitler. Heisenberg didn't care for the Nazis, but Heisenberg was a German. And so he didn't leave the country. And so he either kidnapped him or killed him. And we won. Spoiler alert, we won the war. Okay. Uh, Mo didn't like paperwork. When he had Bill Donovan as his boss, who really liked him, and he had people that were familiar with him, he never came back with receipts from hotels. He would say, I just spent this money. And they would go, all right, fine, let's go. Well, after the war, people retired, people moved on. They wanted receipts. So Mo lost out. He, he was kind of a freelancer, and they stopped giving him jobs in the CIA. So he was kind of a bum. He, he hung around. But one of the people he hung around with was Albert Einstein. So he goes to Albert. Albert invites him up. And Albert says, all right. Tell you what, I'll explain the theory of relativity to you if you explain the rules of baseball to me. Okay. So, so you go first. So Mo starts explaining the rules of baseball, and about two minutes into he's explaining. Wait, wait, wait. I'll explain relativity to you. That's a lot simpler. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, Mo hangs around a, it's, it's sad. He lived at his brother's house. And his brother said, his brother's a doctor. His brother was in the first medical team to come to Hiroshima after the bomb drop to treat victims, Sam Burke. So his brother was a real guy. His brother had to get an eviction order to throw Mo out of the house. So he it was estranged from his brother. He would just drop in on people and hang around, and then people would say, oh, uh, you're not. He said, oh, I guess I'll be leaving. So he fell out of bed uh, and had, ultimately, it aggravated an aneurysm. He was hospitalized, and uh, his last words to the nurse was, were, how did that do it? And he died. Um, so, anyway, the New York Times uh, had several interesting quotes and also felt compelled. He could speak 10 languages, his friends used to say, but he can't hit any of them. That was in his open. So, I know I'm going to have something about my ability to hit in my open, too. Anyway, he, uh, his baseball card is on display in Central. Intelligence Agency Headquarters. Uh, there is a pla plaque about him, and on the website they give insight about him over. He receives, uh, he receives the uh, Medal of Honor, but he won't accept it. And then when he dies, his sister accepts it for him. Um, and uh, as a result of the publicity on Mo, there is now an exhibit in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Uh, and as you can see, they let anybody in, uh, even fat people. But it's a very interesting exhibit. It's a lot of his memorabilia that his brother and his sister donated to the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's worth checking out. Uh, there's two biographies of Mo Burke and the film that we'll see. And Moberg is discussed in this fascinating book about exhibition games and that you can get over in, in our bookstore here. Any questions? Thank you for listening.